you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, man. How are you? Not too bad, mate. Let me turn this up. Let me turn this up. So I'm glad to finally get you on. We've had a bit of a, a few uh, a few mishits. How are you doing? Yeah, you're... we have. We have, haven't we? Yeah. This, this thing is telling me to install things, by the way, so... Oh, just it's, uh, probably asking you to install the app. You can probably ignore it. You, can, can you see me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's finished now. It's finished now. Sorted. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's it though. I think it's uh, it's good to, it's good to get you on. I think we do these things for a few different people, but uh, there was quite a few uh, people wanting to have a have a couple of questions your way. So um, I was watching that um, that Brit Pop show. What was it called again? That was on Netflix. You know, uh, this is pop, and you were you, you popped up on that, and uh, I thought, well, there's did I? Yeah, you was <laughs> you was on that. There was a uh, uh, let's have a look. Was it called This Is Pop? Yeah, This Is Pop. There was a Brit Pop episode, and you was uh, he was in it. So I thought. There's a chance to uh, to have a chat and see if uh, see if you fancy having a, a few questions with us. So uh, yeah, of course, man, of course, yeah. I'm, I'm quite. Somebody else mentioned this um, bloody thing, and um, I, I didn't even know I was on. So <laughs> I don't know where these. I don't know where they get their. Uh, anyway, clips. Was it that any good? Was that any good? <laughs> I'd say so. Well, one of the questions from the lads down 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 there is uh, is actually just relating to that show, and he says that yourself and Jane Savage were the highlights of it. So considering oh, cool. considering you didn't know you was in it, it's nice to be the it's highlight. Of it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is it. This is it. I'm like, I'm like one of those, um, you know, false number nines in football. You this know. Is it. <laughs> This I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was a good show, actually. It was a series about a few different scenes, but the, the Brit put one was pretty good. And I think whenever Jane Savage is on anything, she's quite a, a talker with full of stories. And similar, to, you definitely were filmed for it, I think, or at least it looked like you were. The background of it looked like it was uh, uh, for the for the show. But regardless, that was kind of what prompted the, the chat. We've done a few of these. This group was only set up. It was set up during lockdown. I was just a bit bored, and it just seems to have taken off quite well. Uh, we've done a few yeah. things with uh, with uh, with various names, and yeah, like I said, there's a few requests for yourself for a while now. So I just thought, you know what? Let's see if we can crack you on and see what we can uh, what we can come up with. But where, where are you? Where are you? Manchester? Yeah. You Manchester? I'm from, I'm from Manchester, but I'm actually just up outside of Edinburgh. Oh, okay. Maybe what do you What do you get up to? Uh, well, I'm, I work in finance, funny enough. That's uh, uh, on the oh. financial services side, and it's uh, music has always been the, the hobby since I was a kid. Um, and coming from Manchester, it's always been you know you, can, you can't do anything but enjoy music. Being in Manchester, you know, let's go with that. And I think uh, yeah, when I, I actually feel like when I moved up to Scotland, I clung onto Manchester even more. And um, that's when I started collecting various bits and pieces of memorabilia and. Uh, I mean, just today I've just got this uh, this this rough cut of what of Wonderwall from uh, a fellow in America that I've had converted and just chucked on the YouTube channel. So these these little bits I find really interesting. You know, the unusual mm. one-off like, one item. Once you've got all the vinyl, you know, and you've got the bits and pieces, there's not much else you can do really. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just gone down that that rabbit hole that doesn't you know the, the rabbit hole of uh, I'm not going to spend anything this month, and then somebody offers you a. A magic bean from Noel Gallagher's garden, and that's it. You're in. You're up. <laughs> you know, else, you know. But um, but yeah, no, it's uh, we're on, we're on pretty late, pal. So I won't, I won't keep you too long, mate. I think just uh, there's not there's not too much in here really to be honest with you. But, okay, uh, far uh, away, my man, far away. Crosses that might might uh, take a few minutes, so I get I get cracking on. I think I think everybody will be aware of who you are anyway. But just in case, whenever I get asked a question on the group or on Instagram. What is the best Oasis book? There must be about 15 up, up there, but without a doubt, Getting High is always the one that gets all the votes. And I think it's just known as being the most factually correct book. And I think because you were there, thank you. It really helps. And I think um, that comes through in what you're told during this. Obviously, then in two years, I spent, well, I spent, um, I spent, um, I spent a year writing that basically. Well, yeah. just under a year. And that was like, if I worked, I started in January of when was Nebworth? Ninety seven? No, ninety six. Nebworth was ninety six. Yeah, ninety six. Yeah, so I started in January of ninety six. Yeah, and I took two breaks. I, I I was exhausted. I got to. I was working every day like ten in the morning till like twelve at night, writing that, 
and because I knew because I was I knew I'd been in a really privileged position it's not often you get to be right in the center of a band that gets so big do you know what I mean I saw it all unfold so um I, I knew it was it was a really important you know I put everything I had into it and I took one week off in July and then I took the Nebworth weekend off uh, and then I finished it in round about October. And to give you an idea of the intensity of that book is like, honestly, for a month afterwards, I was absolutely lost. It was like, that's all I'd done for like 10 months. Yeah. I didn't know what to do with myself. It was like I'd lost a, a child or something, you know. Yeah. So it's great. You know, I, I never think really, you know, be really happy about because I put so much work into it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it comes, it shines through, it does, because I think you do get, there are books that are out there that you can tell have been rushed and mm. uh, and, and, and just just, just Googled. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's another book, um, some might say by Richard Bowie, you might have heard of that one, that came mm. out in the last, in the last couple of years. That's another one that goes into great detail. That goes that goes from to the end of the career. A lot of books seem to end around about halfway through. So Richard's end up right to the end. So that and yours are the two that I go back to to reread quite often. Um, it was nice. Well, I always thought that there should be a book which picked, because, you know, I bailed out round after. Well, I did the uh, Forever the People book. Yeah. But that, you know, that, that was a tour book, which was a different beast. Um, Two years uh, after and, that, wasn't it? That was two two years after, wasn't it, from memory? Yeah, it was a Be Here Now tour. So it yeah, was ninety seven. Yeah. It was late ninety seven through to it was six months. Yeah. So September ninety seven through to March of uh, January, February, March of ninety eight. Um, and I based that. Well, there, there's a Beatles book called Love Me Do. You ever read that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, so I, I was trying to. I was trying to do that really. I was there. Yeah. That, 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 that was my love me too. And then, and then after that, it, that, there was nothing more to say. And then, of course, it all kind of went tits up for the band. And yeah. and for me, when Gwigsy and Bonehead left, that 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 that, that was it, really. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, I, I wasn't interested after that. It was they'd, they'd become a, a to me. I, I went to see him at Wembley, and and it was just you know I, I didn't like it. Tribute you know? also. Well, the thing was, the thing was that Nebworth, you know, Nebworth, everyone was there, man. Like Mods, Goths, Skins, Ted's, whoever. Do you know what I mean? There was everybody. It was incredible. And three years later, it was just guys, you know, getting pissed and pretending they're Liam Gallagher. You know. Yeah. Well, actually, that's one of that's one of the questions towards the end. Actually, that uh, someone says, "Do you think they should have bowed out after Nebworth?" Yeah. Uh, oh, I, big time. I, yeah. With, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would have been brilliant. That I mean, imagine that you know, right at the height of it, just saying, "Okay, see you later." I, I, I was, I was always amazed that they kept. I thought after Nebworth they would take a year off. Do you know what I mean? I thought, yeah, yeah. I thought the obvious, you know, they'd worked so hard and everything. And I thought you should take a year off now. You should disappear, you know, and yeah. you know, and then, and then come back fighting strong you know but they yeah. just kept going and i think they just got worn out really well is that is that a multi-platinum what's the story i can see behind you there is that what that is on the wall oh my god yeah, yeah, is, yeah, that yeah. That, is, that, is that what that is oh, there, yeah. fuck, i forgot about that <laughs> yeah that's one, my um <laughs> yeah no 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 got, got me that one yeah beautiful beautiful yeah. Well, that's so. So, David Walker on a group has chucked in four questions. Um, he says, okay. How important do you think your authoring of the jam book and no previously reading it was was to getting the chance to write about Oasis? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty important. I bumped into, um, I, I, I was introduced to Noel, I saw Oasis at the Ford Kentish Town Forum and then at the Astoria two nights later, it was a Tuesday and a Thursday. And Noel knew who I was because he'd read A Beacon Show and obviously he was a big jam fan. Uh, so I think that was important just to kind of break the ice. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah. mean, 
Uh, and then when, when was that? November or something like that? But in January, I got a phone call from him saying he was in Johnny Marr's flat in Fulham. Did I want to come over? Me and Paul actually went over. Um, and uh, that's when I first got to know him. Um, and then he suggested... No suggestion. You remember that there was a, a, a DVD from South End on Sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I DJed at that. That's that was the first place I DJed at. Um, and so I think it was that. It was also, you know, football was a big thing. Yeah. And the Beatles, music and football. Just all interlinked by the sounds of it, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was at that point, wasn't it? And. Um, and just that, and then also the fact that, you know, both Noel and I had had sort of turbulent upbringings, really. So, which we never really spoke about, but that was kind of there. Do you yeah, know what I mean? He yeah. knew, I knew he'd gone through shit and he knew I'd gone through shit, you know, so. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but yeah, that jam thing was, yeah. It, well, it's it, got it played its part. Please, quite nicely, as you mentioned there, the South MLC. David's next question is, did being the tour DJ help you gain the mm. band's trust and immerse you into their world? Would it have been Well, yeah, 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 it did. Nice. Because what yeah. happened was, and I was really glad to do it, because if I'd been the just the writer on that tour, when I walked into the dressing room, people would look at me and think, oh, there's the writer and shut mm. up. But they didn't. They thought, oh, there's Paolo, he's the DJ. Yeah. They forgot they forgot I was writing it all down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that it, it, it was kind of camouflage. <laughs> well, that's it. I was that's underground. It. I was one, underground. One of them, yeah. yeah, it does seem to be that it was a bit of a, a the, the kind of gang of years back then and before your time as well. There was, you know, your your, your Brian Cannon, your Owen Morris. It was a bit, yeah. of a, wasn't it, for the first four? And it's like, what to to immerse yourself into that at album three is just. A golden ticket, really, isn't it? So, I think that's exactly that's exactly. well. The thing was, the thing was as well is that is that they were really tight at that point. Yeah. One of my favourite chapters in Getting High is, I don't know what, what what bit is, but it's, I don't know how I managed to do it to be honest with you, Carl. But somehow I managed to kind of get back to the hotel room and write down everything I'd I'd seen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And especially if you've had a few drinks and that or whatever, it's 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 a. But I managed to do it every night. I was very disciplined. And there's this bit where Liam hasn't got a house, and Bonehead is like, "My God, that's dreadful." And there's this all this dialogue about Liam not having a house, and he'd never, you know, he'd lived in hotels. When the band kicked off, he just lived in hotels. He didn't have yeah. anywhere to go. And um, I, I. I I was really glad I got that right because I just thought this really shows how close they all are. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There was this yeah. real closeness with them. They really were. And that's, that's what I picked up when I saw them at the Kentishtown Forum. I just thought, you know, there was, they, they were like this gang and they, they all stood there. Yeah. Like just glaring at the audience, you know. And then, you know, they were playing this huge music, but they wouldn't move, you know. Normally bands move, you know, like guitarists run across the stage or jump up or, you know. Yeah, but they didn't. They, they, you know, there was this huge sound. They were just standing there like that. You know, it was quite something. And that is an attitude. Yeah. I think that that's that's the upbringing coming from. I mean, I'm from a place called Openshaw, which is uh, yeah. not far not far from from the Burnage side of town, really. And it's yeah, I think because they were literally plucked out of that into Nebworth. You know, it's just a completely different. And I don't think they lost that attitude or that uh, that that um, brazenness throughout the whole time. Really, it was a uh, and even to this day, Liam last night was playing the NHS, and it's just like he's the same fellow that's walked out at the boardwalk. You know, it's uh, mm. it's good to see because it, it does it does change bands, doesn't it? Often when they start um, playing the arenas and getting bigger. well, I did think it did change him to be honest with you, because you know on that Be Here Now tour, they started all having separate cars. Oh yeah, right. After the gigs, and you know, coming out the phone box and. <laughs> you know, all that palaver, it was all a bit silly, I thought, you know. Yeah, but a, I, I think they were kind of, you know, I think, you know, management were like, you, you, you're you not in the boardwalk anymore. You know, you're playing to, I mean, one of the points I made in the Be Here Now book was that they were playing these huge gigs, right? There were 54 people on the road 
right? And it was like 30, 40,000 people each night. And it become like a, you know, they, they couldn't, you know, they, they, you know, that sense of, you know, when you went to those early Oasis gigs, it was like, are they going to get on stage or not? You know, do you know what I mean? It was, there, there was that kind of, you know, what's going to happen here that, you know, but transpose that into a huge arena. And, you know, the band were now, I think it became a, a slog. I think it became a job. That's why I think Wigsy and Bonehead left because all the fun went out of it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, and they kept talking about the past all the time. You know, whenever I was with them, they, it was always, I remember that time when we played the, you know, the, the, the dog and duck in Leeds and, you know, fucking police were there and all, you know, it was all that, you know, it was all that, you know, all that reminiscing about how, you know, and I, I thought this is quite, they, I'd never heard them talk like that before, but, you know, when they were on their way up, it was never about that. It was just about what a laugh it all was. In the moment, you know, they were yeah. just having a laugh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think by the time of being here now, the, you know, the fun had gone out of it, really. Do you think with your, with your first gig being the, as the Oasis DJ itself and on sea, five days before Tony mm. McCarroll left, did you, were you immediately aware that something was no. happening? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't pick up on any of that yeah i don't think i was uh, no because i kind of got down there i dj for a bit i i think i was there was some friends of mine there and we and then then we just went back i i didn't know anything about the mccarroll thing going on yeah um it was only when they started recording thingy wasn't it um that one <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, they, they got Alan White in. They got Alan White in. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, I knew Alan because of Steve White. You know. Yeah. Was there any? Was there any uh, awkward introductions for you there? Or was it just a hi? How are you doing? When it when he came on board. Who Alan? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah, it was good. But, you know, yeah. It's what it is. Yeah. 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 I was watching uh, Supersonic last week for the fifty-eight thousandth time. <laughs> <laughs> One of them things that when the missus goes to bed at whatever time it is on a Friday and we've had a bottle of wine and whatever, she goes to bed and I think, I could go to bed, you know, get turned down. Or I can stay down there and watch, uh, watch a film. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, go, I'll, go with, uh, I'll go with Supersonic this. But I watched it and um, I was I was kind of thinking about, I was putting the questions together from all the lads on the group uh, for this. And then and then your voice popped up. So I was like, oh, you, you, you reminisced about the time when, um, when Liam and Noel's dad turned up in Ireland. Yeah, in Dublin, uh, yeah. What was What was... What was that like? You know, what was that? Because that that must have been from well, work. that 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 that, that 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 was um, Dublin. I can't say Dublin was just out of this world. It was amazing. That first the gig, the I think it was a place called the Point. Yeah, the Dublin and, Point. Uh, yeah, and the the uh, that they were just, you know, I mean, at that time it was like, yeah, it was big. But this was so intense. It, it was beyond. I mean, th that crowd went absolutely crazy. It was brilliant. It really was. And then outside the hotel, there were these fans and they just sang Oasis songs all night long. They just stayed outside the hotel singing. Yeah. You know, I, and, and, and everywhere you went, it was just great. You know, went to these clubs and people were brilliant. And the whole weekend was just great until that happened. Do you know what I mean? And it kind of, and you knew that, I think it was a Daily Mail or somebody had, had brought them yeah. over and they knew Liam was going to react and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was just, it just ruined the night, really. Everybody kind of went to bed a bit depressed. And I think the next day, Noel wouldn't come out of his room. And um, I think by then he'd gone anyway. Mm. Um, so it, it was just, you know... I've, this, you know, you know when there's a really good party right going on and you know somebody starts a fight you know it was that really yeah yeah that's it well i think that I mean, on, on the back of that we're talking about that i think it might have been was it the news of the world maybe i can't think it was a problem or brought them over probably again. news of the world so. that might, might have been them or daily mail like you say i think at the stage do you think the media went a bit too far with the band with it i mean even at the earliest stages the media would they, they sold papers they sold papers you see the clever thing that oasis did was that they were completely up front you see in the 80s 
you know, when I was I, in the 80s, I was an enemy and melody maker, so I saw it happening. But, yeah. uh, you know, the Nationals picked up on pop music. And um, so, you know, suddenly Boy George is on the cover of the Daily Mirror. And by George, isn't he a, isn't he a wacky one? And, and do you know what I mean? All that stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, they, and then, of course, when they, a year later, when, George is doing drugs or, you know, shock horror of, you know, and then and then they, you know, they, they bring them down. But Oasis were up front from the very first, you know, from kickoff, they were up front. We want to be rock stars. We do loads of cocaine. We want to shag supermodels. We want to live in big houses. We want Rolls Royces. We want millions of pounds. So they could never do an expose on them because <laughs> it was all out there anyway. Yeah, it was all out there anyway. I mean, I remember, I remember this one paper had a Liam did cocaine on the top of a coach or something crazy, <laughs> or you know Liam does cocaine or something like that. And I just had the sense of the whole whole country going, yeah, and <laughs> so yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and your point is. You know, because because they were start front, so so they were great copy. You know, for these newspapers, you know, the, for that two or three years, they really, um, you know, they they sold papers. You know, especially <laughs> Liam throwing punches. But then it got to the point where I remember reading this Daily Mirror headline, and I thought, oh, well, this is all over now because it read something like. Oasis must have a new album coming out. Liam just tried to punch one of our photographers. Do you know what I mean? Like it was all... Yeah, yeah. Like it know, was orchestrated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, <clears throat> that, but so the media, the, so, you know, the, that's what the media do. They grab hold of something, they run with it until it runs out, and then they move on to the next thing. And uh, they, Oasis had a good run of however many years it was, two years, three years. Yeah. Yeah, and then they move on to whoever the next, I don't know, little mix or whoever they, you know, whoever it is, Harry Styles. I don't know, you know. I can't follow current music, mate. I can't do it, Paolo. I'm looking around my room now, and I can't. There's not many bands in here that are from past the year 2000. I think I'm just locked in that little time wall. <laughs> happily, <laughs> happily locked in there. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it's ideal. So there's a chap called Glenn Ross on the group. He's asked. Uh, yeah. Knowing what you know about the Gallaghers, do you think they will ever sort out of a dispute? And what's your opinion on a reunion? The classic, uh, the classic question. Well, <clears throat> uh, what do I think? I would say never say never. Mm. Um, I think probably time will heal things and, you know, everything. Yeah. Uh, if they did do a reunion, I would... Uh, I. I Personally, I don't like them. I don't like reunions. Yeah. Because... I don't I, think about the Storm Roses. Yeah. It, it's like, you know, Oasis were 94, to me, were 94 to 90. When, when did Griggs and Bonehead go? 99? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around about that, that, the era of the first three to four hours. Those, those five years, those five years, basically the first three years, really, were the essence of that band. And I don't know, I just don't, yeah, I mean, obviously it would be huge and, you know, they'd make yeah. millions and blah, blah, blah. But uh, for me, it's, you know, it's it's a bit like that That train's gone, you know. Yeah, if it, do, it does add on the end there. If, if, it, if there was a reunion and you could pick a lineup, who would you go for? You're just going to say... Well, it'd, be the original, it'd, be the, it'd be the Alan White, Griggsy yeah. Bonehead, Liam Noel. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Noted. So when you was when you was on tour, do you remember um, the security, Rob? Rob Rankin? Yes, yeah, Rob? yeah, lovely guy, yeah. Yeah, so Rob's in the group and he's put a question in for you. He's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, just let Paolo know I've enjoyed all of his books, especially Forever the People. That was a great one. Great photographs mm -hmm. in that one. Um, he says, oh, that's because some of them were his. Some of them in there, yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you're obviously away on, on the European tour in 97. Ask him if he ever got his money for the Harry the Hotspur debate. No, was the judge. Yeah, no, never, never got the money. Do you, do you know about that? No, so we're going to need an explanation on that one now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, they, they would, 
they did it a couple of times. They would kind of gang up. They they would choose someone to pick on, and that and he was in Vienna, and they asked me how Tottenham Hotspur had got their name, and I told them that Tottenham, obviously, because you know I'm Spurs, right? So Tottenham, because obviously it's Tottenham. Hotspur was because it was from um, a uh, one of the Shakespeare plays. There's a character called Harry the Hotspur. Right. right. That's where Hotspur came from, and they found this completely hilarious and they blah 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 so so we had these massive bets you know no was it was a bit thingy to be honest with you because no was getting his uh, american express card out you know come on you want to you know so yeah i'll take them take your money all day long but no <laughs> of course i never got paid <laughs> i really like rob because yeah. i mean this sounds like you know i don't want to be name dropping or or whatever but anyway it was johnny depp used to come and see the band when he could and in los angeles he invited us all back to his house mm. and me and me and noel he had his own bar there johnny depp he didn't drink at that time i don't know if he does now well according to court reports he does but <laughs> he had his own bar there and suddenly it's six in the morning and there's me and noel and you know obviously we've been doing things and but I kept saying to Rob, how do you keep up? Because <laughs> he was, didn't drink, didn't do anything. You know, we, I was like, how do you do this? Suddenly it's nine o'clock in the morning. We've gone through the whole, you know, night. But he was a lovely guy, Rob. He's trying to do his book as well, I think. He wants to do a... Yeah, it's, 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 been, uh, it's been quite active on a group, actually. Sometimes someone joins, you just think, oh, I wonder if it's going to be quite a closed book. But it's just been amazing. Some of the stuff he's shared, some of the images that he's got. And he's got his own, he's, going, he's, he's setting up his own um, scene now. He's got his own studio where he's going to do prints and whatnot. So if he does do a book, I think he's got an archive of stuff that he could pull upon. Yeah, um, yeah. He's, yeah, he's... I, you know, I, you know, I... I, I... Because I have all the security, he was the one I liked. He he was top boy. He was he was yeah. great. And it's interesting how how us, us kind of fans and collectors work. That some of the stuff that you guys will have chucked in a drawer somewhere, we think, oh my god, wow, look at that! It's a pass from '97. It's a it's a it's a laminate. I know. I, I see. I'm I'm rubbish at all that stuff, man. Yeah. yeah. People always have a you know. I mean, like if you think about it, in the '80s, I interviewed all these people. I should have kept the tapes. I never did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know Joe Strummer. Brit, well, Springsteen wouldn't let me tape him. Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, oh. da da da, Bee, Bird of Boo. <laughs> I should have just kept the tapes, man. But you I know, you know, was, hmm? you should have kept everything. Absolutely. Yeah, everything. I should have kept yeah. everything. I ne- yeah. With Oasis, I never kept any of my interviews with Noel or Liam or Quigsey. I never kept any of them. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. Yeah. Um, i will be a millionaire by now if I had. Well, you'd be retired. You've been on an island now. That's it. You're yeah, exactly. Feet up. <laughs> Loving yeah. life. <laughs> um, um, a man, Jonathan Craig, up in Aberdeen, he said, uh, what would be your one main highlight of the tour, if you could pick a highlight? A nice- oh, Aberdeen. They played a gig in Aberdeen. It was fucking amazing because it was a small place. It was one of the... It, was, it wasn't It was a big place, but they played this place in Aberdeen because I don't think they... You know, Aberdeen didn't have a stadium. They were mainly playing stadiums at this point. But that gig in, Ab- that gig in Aberdeen was, it was, you know, I saw him a few times. Yeah, and yeah really, I don't know how to see it there. It was a really good gig, that. Really good gig, yeah. Yeah, well, were you there? Were you there? No, no, but I've got I've got a CD, an old bootleg of it over there somewhere in a corner. But so it's yeah. interesting that Jonathan's from Aberdeen, and your and your highlight is the Aberdeen. Gig. Oh God, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. It, it was a small place, and they they just. You know, it was just one of them where crowd and crowd and band just locked, yeah. and it was just brilliant. It was fantastic. One of the, the things, and I don't think I put it in the book. One of the things that I never really, I never asked Noel about, which I should have done, was that they played the same set every night. Mm. It was like for six months they just played the same set. They didn't change it. They didn't throw in the new songs or. Yeah, you know, cool. yeah. it was weird. Do you know what I mean? I d- it was like that's what I mean. It'd become like a job. It was like, well, this is what we do, and yeah, yeah. So, so uh, told them, yeah, yeah. So a chap, Gary Black, he's chucked in a couple here. This, what this, I had to re- I had to research on this question because I wasn't too sure what he was meaning, but it'll it'll mean a lot more to you. Uh, obviously, yeah. Noel was a huge Weller fan. Was he also yeah. a fan of the Cappuccino Kid? 
and was that <laughs> referenced at all when Noel asked him to do the linear notes for Morning Glory? No, it was because um, Cappuccino Kid is Star Council days, and and they weren't, yeah. they didn't like the Star Council. They 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 were jam jam guys. Yeah. So you know the idea about this guy who sits in cafes and. <laughs> Not pens these poetic uh, things, you know, <laughs> wearing a cravat wouldn't really fucking go. What the fuck's that about? You know, so they wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't go for that. I do like the man accent. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's well, I did pick it up. I, I used to have it down to the team when I was hanging out with those guys. <laughs> See, I've lost because you do that. say because they used to get really annoyed when people talked about the way they said fucking because they do say fucking like f double o. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd, 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 I've because of my job and living in Scotland, I've had to kind of neutralise my accent as best. <laughs> I can. But the second I get, the second I go back home with the lads, it's a different story. Then you know, it's straight back. Yeah, in, bet. The way I bet. it's a very uh, thing. I mean, that 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 was one of the things they kind of reverted back to being Manx. You know, on that be here now tour. That's yeah. what I mean. Like, you know, I was saying earlier about them reminiscing. Suddenly, it was all you know. You know, Sonny was all about being a mank, and yeah, it was kind of a bit. I don't know. I always thought that music was about liberation. You know, you got to be yourself. You got to, you know, do what you got. You know, do you know what I mean? That kind of yeah, stuff, yeah. and kind of all got a bit manky. You know, I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way at all. But it, you know, it, it was very. It was like they kind of went back to that, whereas I kind of saw them always as more. You know, when I first met them, they were, you know, oh, you know, the, they, there was such a big difference. You know, when you first met, wow, we're going to Japan. Wow, we're going here, we're going there, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And, you know, four years later, it was like, oh, fuck, we're going to Japan. Oh. Do you know what I mean? It, <laughs> it, it kind of got, yeah, it kind of got like that. The 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 the, the Mancunia thing being from Manchester used to do people's heads in when when mm -hmm. even even ten years later being a student in Manchester because I'm thirty seven. Mm. When I was at uni, you would always get people coming to Manchester, and within 15 minutes of dropping a bag off, they've got a Joy Division T-shirt on and they're walking at a 90 degree angle. <laughs> you think, how's that? How's that? Yeah. You know, I think there was a what was it, the Kevin and Perry sketch? You remember when? Uh, yes. Perry went away to Manchester and came back. That's how it felt at that stage. You know, it was a very yeah. uh, a cultural thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a bit of a unusual. But one. the thing was, the thing was, they all lived in London. Yeah, yeah. That's what got <laughs> yeah. me. It was like they used to go on about it and. I mean, they'd call me a Cockney, but which I'm not because I wasn't born in London. Yeah, but, you know, because I've got a, I've lived in London for med forty years or something, so I've got a, a North London accent, and um, you know, they'd be like fucking Cockneys. I'd be like, yeah, but where do you, Primrose Hill, where you live, and where are you, Hampstead, and you're over in Mill. The only one who, the only one out of it was Bonehead. He Bonehead. he got based in Manchester. Yeah. That was funny. He told me this great story. When when they moved in, so they'd moved into this posh area of Manchester and they'd moved in. And um, as they're moving in, this Kurt, the guy who lives next door is this kind of retired colonel who puts his head over the fence and says, oh, hello, chap. You know, um, we've got a bit of a problem. My azaleas are spilling over into your garden. I'll tell you what, come around and have a whiskey and introduce yourself and, you know, we can discuss the fence, you know. <laughs> so Bonehead says, okay, you know, Bonehead, because Bonehead's a lovely guy and Bonehead thinks, well, you know, you you know, make peace with the neighbours, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he goes around to see him. Hello, old chap, come in, come what, what do you want to drink? Have a whiskey? Yeah, yeah, I'll have a whiskey, that'd be great. So uh, what do you do, old boy? He says, oh, I'm in a band. Well, I hope you're not in that fucking oasis band. Bunch of <laughs> fucking... <laughs> Bunch of hooligans, bunch of drug taking louts. <laughs> what did you say to that? Just put the whiskey down and leave the I think he must have done. He didn't, he didn't. I don't know what he did to that. He must have. He probably did say, well, yeah. yeah nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a small world. My, my uncle lives about three streets away from, from Bonehead now. It's quite surreal to think that uh, mm. over, over down, down in Manchester. But yeah, I think he was the only one that stuck around, wasn't he? That's it. Yeah, yeah. All the rest of them were down in London. It was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. But there you go. Yeah, so we're not too far off now. So I think Tristane's um, question was, uh, well, we kind of answered it at the start, really. He was the chap that said he just watched the This Is Pop uh, and thought you and Jane Savage uh, were the best parts of it. So you have to watch that, see if you remember. Well, tell, well, tell, tell them whoever, whoever that 
Who's that saying that? Tristine, Tristine. Well, tell him he or she has got very good taste. <laughs> and I've always, I've always liked them. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Absolutely. <laughs> that's what it was. Do you, do you get asked to go for a lot of these sort of things? He says, do you get asked to go on these sort of reminiscent shows at the past? And we... I did a lot because what happened was in the nineties, Channel Four kind of got, got into a lot of music doc stuff. Yeah. So and obviously Oasis, I got, I, I did a lot of stuff around, but also. Um, you know, 60s bands I'd written about the small faces. Um, yeah, I, I I I did get quite a few. Yeah, they, they, there's not so much now because I I don't they, I don't know. There doesn't seem to be that much music stuff going on at the moment, documentary wise. Shame. I think uh, there's a, there's a, an Oasis podcast based in Peru. A chap called Carlos Medina. He really. Does- so he's, 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 he's got a question, but he's also said he'd love to have a chat with you in the future at some stage. So there's your plug, Carlos, a dummy bit. <laughs> but he's a really nice fella. He said, uh, knowing that you've witnessed lots of works in progress when you were hanging around with Oasis, do you recall any songs that are not yet released? No. Hmm. Uh, I was just thinking there was one... No, 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 no. I, I never heard no. No. Um, because I heard me and my big mouth at the sound check for at Leicester de Montford Hall. I remember that. Uh, and then, but that obviously showed up on uh, yeah thingy. <clears throat> oh, actually. I don't know if it ever made a. No, I think it. Was there, have you got? Is there a? Uh-huh. Is, there a C, is there a CD of Noel Gallagher demos? The Mustique demos. So there What's was the first track on there? Do oh, you know? well, it's actually in the uh, in the box set, the Be Here Now box set. I have to find it, but it's uh it's uh it's good it's good but it's all demos of th- it's been out for it's been around for a good while that and it was released yeah. to be here now box set um oh well, i see okay four, four years ago <laughs> basically he used to I, i'm a big beach boys fan and he he wasn't a he didn't like him yeah um and then so i put a, a track called forever which is a solo track by dennis wilson who was the drummer it's on an album called pacific blue and it starts down, 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 down. And um, the next song, and and then about a year later, I wasn't hanging out with them anymore. And I saw this CD thing and I bought it. And the first track it was complete and utter rip off <laughs> this Beach Boys song. And I thought, ah, but that, I'm, I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm getting off. The answer is no. The answer is no. Well, I think that's, well, that's, well, that's the most. I mean, I've, I've got, um, a record of the 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 dat tape of the GMAX gig from that year from '97, the sound check of it, and it's like three hours long and it's basically noise. But there's a couple of, there's a couple of songs on there that I'm sitting there thinking, that's never seen the light of day. That's wow, the- wow. So I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking I wonder I wonder if any of you guys ever heard these. I'm actually currently trying to give these back to Noel. By the way, I'm trying to give them back to Noel for him to do as he pleases with, rather than being sat in my cupboard. The better off being in the hands of the man who, who wrote them. Um, yeah, which would be amazing to see if he if he does take them. What happens with them? Um, watch this space for that, I guess. But um, yeah, so so Paul over in Ireland said fights and arguments aside, what was the nicest moment you'd seen between Liam and Noel? That's a good question. Uh, I think the most I think the most telling one was when we were in Argentina and it was like a all night session and Noel was saying you know what, at the end of this tour, that's it. I'm just going to put my feet up. I'm not going to write any songs, I'm not going to play any gigs. 
I'm just going to sit in a chair and drink beer and watch football. And that's what I'm doing for the next five years. Yeah. And Liam yeah. said, no, you won't. And I said, how do you know? And he said, because I'm your brother. Yeah. And yeah. that, I thought, was very telling moment, as it were. Because <laughs> Noel looked at him like, fuck, yeah, <laughs> you're all right. <laughs> Of course, he's going to write songs. And a few like amazing that. moments like that, isn't it? They, they pop up on YouTube here and there, and you just think it's, uh, you know, it's. I think I think Noel had said at one stage, you know, it might be a, a so and so, but I want I want some someday, someone's going to hit him, and I'm going to be like, hey, that's my brother, and it's them little moments. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Got, that's got... that, like that earlier question: Will they ever? I wouldn't be surprised if they're talking now. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It is. I mean, the brotherly connection thing. I mean, I've I've got a brother who's two years younger than me, and we right. hated each other until I was 18, 19. Now he's your best mate. I've got two yeah. little boys myself, four and two. I heard right. them the other night for, for 10 minutes over who was the biggest Muppet. So that's the way they, they're at that age now where they're going to be scrapping for a few years, but they'll end up being best friends. Yeah. It is a bond. Well, I've got a five and, five and 16 month year old. Right, well, yeah, all right, okay, quite close to myself then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why That's why I asked for an extension to 9.30, because, like, if he was awake now, there's no way I'd be talking to him. <laughs> Get there, there. He'd want to know. He told me, he said, he said to me, he said, I said, look, I've got to do this Zoom meeting. Said, go to sleep, go to bed. I'll do it with you, he said. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? We should have done that. I should have brought Charlie in, because I'm, I'm trying yeah. to everything I'm doing in this room. Everything I'm doing, in my, I'm actually about to. She's finally backed over, and I'm now moving into a bigger room because I'm just I'm too cramped in here with the records and the stuff. But it, everything's just to Charlie, to Taylor, to my two little boys, and I just feel yeah. like there's going to be that moment in future where they'll click and music will hit them, and they'll watch yeah. the interviews back on Daddy's computer, and then they'll and then if they like Oasis, they'll suddenly find all these records that are signed to them. Yeah. And I just think that'll be a, a nice moment. They'll probably end up liking Scissor Sisters and not liking my music. I don't know. That'll yeah. be on them, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, do you like? Uh, do you like later Oasis? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I do. I do because I think if I compare it to when it came out as a fan, what else was around at that stage? Even if it, even if people think they were on the decline, even at their, their worst, they were a lot better than most bands' best. If that makes right, sense. Right, to me. right. Yeah, got you, got you. But I think for me, Oasis and The Verve are my two lifelong massive... You know, the Urban Hymns was the first album I ever bought when I was 13. Oh, well, it's going to have a big effect on you. Yeah, and I think uh, then I went back to the first couple of albums. And it's all kind of interlinked, isn't it, really? The Verve and the Oasis story and yeah. the people yeah. that were involved uh, producing and designing sleeves and, and how, the, how the bands all made each other. So that whole scene was just my bubble, really. Mm. Um, you know, the whole Britpop scene, really, was my kind of scene but for Oasis yeah I mean I've dipped in and out of the albums you know there was a stage where I went away from the Oasis sort of music into skateboard music I had blue hair right. for years you know so I, did, I dipped away from it from that stage but then came back into it again once I was at uni so it's um yeah I do, I do like them all Dig Out Your Soul was a, a struggle I'd say 50% of that I really liked 50% of it I struggled with but um yeah I do uh, and I think maybe that's um just the obsessive person inside me, really. It's been a bit mm. of a, uh, a long journey that's not going to end. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a weird one. But um, do you think if uh, Tom Tom Agomba here has asked a question, do you think the death of grunge opened the door to the the scene? Well, that's, you know, that's what Noel's line to me was, was that Nirvana had, you know, swept all before him, but it was like, you know, why, why, you know why are why are why are why isn't um, why aren't there British bands doing this? You know, and <clears throat> you know the thing is about you know rock music in the eighties was dire. It was dreadful. Yeah. You know there was this thing called shoegazing and the, all these indie bands, and they were just all. You know, just oh, just for me, just I mean, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't even listen to rock music in the eighties. I got a lot of stick for liking Oasis because, the enemy especially, I was just writing about hip hop and especially Acid House because mm. once that hit, you know, that, that 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 was like the most exciting thing 
going, you know, it was brilliant. Um, uh, so Oasis were the first rock band, you know, modern rock band I liked for years and years and years, you know, because they had it all. They had great songs, a great sound, great attitude, good look, that yeah. gang mentality, you know, talked about football. Brilliant, you know, it was just... You're not going to get I mean, it again, are you? It's not going to happen again, is it? Is it? I don't, I think no, it, no. It, it just was just, now. Yeah, it was just... It was just so exciting, man. It really was. And especially this, you know, especially after he'd written um, that one, Morning Glory. Yeah. You know, because he, you know, he was, you know, it'd be like, you know, I'd go around to see him and wake up three days later somewhere else. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like that, you know. Or he'd go, Oh, come on, let's go down MTV. I say, what, you booked? No, nah, no, nah, let's just go down there. You know, I mean, it was all, you know, it was that. You know, it was great. It was, you know, I was very lucky. Very yeah, lucky. Brilliant time, to, brilliant time to get involved with it, yeah. Did you go yeah, to Yeah, it was brilliant. It really was. And they were funny. I hadn't come across humour like that. They were really funny and they were really, you know, I mean, I mean, Noel, you know, you could see Noel sort of, even then, he's kind of penchant for, you know, you go, oh, I've just met Morrissey and I, I told him this and I told him that. And uh, he's been blown. And I think, yeah, you probably saw him in the street and said hello and that was it. But he yeah. had to blow it up into this epic thing, you know. <laughs> but, you know, all those songs they were writing then. I mean, I remember, you know, like the, like the book starts with, the, well, it does, it starts with Peggy, but. Then he goes into that recording of the master plan, you know. And I remember going to that studio that night, and it was like, wow, this guy just—he was on such a roll then. You yeah. know, every song, every song was like, fucking hell, that's great, you know. And especially things like master plan. To me, my favorite Oasis song, the master plan, without yeah. doubt. Yeah. And then, um, and then the fact it was a B side, you know, and. That's crazy, though, isn't it? That album, an album of B-sides, it could literally blow away. Oh, God, that's probably one of their best albums, right? Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely unbelievable. It's just, it's, it, is, it is up there. I mean, it's the B-sides for Oasis were just... Mm. And actually, the Verve had a very similar kind of um, uh, catalogue. They got it from, the, I think, well, I think Noel got it from the Jam. The Jam used to do that. Yeah. Really good yeah. B-sides. And they were very clever with uh, with with doing promo items and promo vinyl and th things like that will get your your obsessive clowns like myself started going oh I must have every promo vinyl and <laughs> I must have this and I must have that and you know there's a French box over there the model of this and so you just think to yourself oh the French oh. box yeah I remember that 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 was like a holy grail that one it's just there behind me <laughs> I've got, I've got <laughs> to it there at the time yeah. Uh, but it's it's uh, uh, here's one foot with the French bus. Then how many of them were out there? Can you remember how many they made? No, it was very rare. I mean, it was, you know, if you had one of those, you were. Yeah, the the king sad act. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I think it's uh, that's something that I was always saying. I'm never going to bother with that. Never going to that. That's too. That's a step too far for me. I'm just sticking with the vinyl. And then, <laughs> you start, then you start getting a few bits and pieces. Then you start, and then some yeah, of them be that. I'm gonna to have to take it now because I'm not gonna be able. I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to get off of it again. So I took it, but it's uh, these these little items are what uh, what make the world go round really and keep the people trading and collecting things. Yeah, 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 talking, yeah. You know, uh, so last last couple now from David Holgado. Um, okay, get, getting high is one of my favourite Oasis books. It gives a real insight into the madness in the peak Oasis years. Compliment. Thank you. Uh, how did you book the greatest footballer you never saw with Wigsy come about? Uh, so I was asked by Select, I think it was Select magazine, to go to Chicago and do a, a story about the band. Yeah. And I got out there uh, and, you know, the thing I understand about Gwigsy is he's, I mean, I'm, I love my football, but he's, he's at another level. He'll, he'll, he'll tell you who's playing left back for Bulgaria in the 1968 <laughs> Euros. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of level. And he said, I'm really, really, so I've got to talk to you, so I'm so fucking pissed off. I said, why? And he went, look at this article. And it was this article in what was then Shoot magazine. And it was five pages about this guy, Robin Friday. He's like, how come I've never fucking heard of him? He was really annoyed about it, you know. Right. And um, I said, well, look, you know, I think they had... 
free it was the summer of 96 i remember that it was when the euros were on then um and i said look they they had time off then i said look let's let's go and find out let's go and see if there's anything there so i, I suppose it was me i called up the reading evening post and every wednesday me and Gwigsa used to um it was hilarious man we used to live we used to um We'd meet at Paddington Station and go down to Reading, right? And they, they got the sports writer there was a guy called Clive Baskerville, right? And <laughs> you get down to Reading and you see these buses, right? And they go, this week, read Clive the Hound Baskerville. <laughs> right? You know, like the Hounds of Baskerville. You know the Sherlock Holmes thing? Yeah, yeah. You know, so like you see that and then you'd go and meet Clive. And uh, and then <laughs> and of course, you know, to them suddenly they've got you know they've got a member of the fucking hottest group in the fucking country <laughs> in this light in their reading room, you know. So these, you know, there was this constant procession of people coming into the into this. So this is where they keep all the bound volumes, right? Yeah, so yeah, we're going yeah. through the bound volumes just to find out about this Robin Friday character and. Uh, <laughs> And like these people would come in, they go, "Oh, hi, yeah, I'm just, oh God, are you from Oasis?" You know, and then you know, yeah, yeah, and they talk. Anyway, one day Clive the Hound Baskerville comes in, and he goes this, he goes, um, Grigsby goes, the local MP says uh, people who take drugs are, uh, you know, ne'er do wells, you know, should all be put in prison. And Grigsby says, like, "Well, he's a fucking dickhead, isn't he? And he can <laughs> fuck right off, you know." And the next week we went down, the headline was Gwigsy slams local MP. <laughs> it was brilliant, man. So anyway, we start doing this research into Robin and the story just got bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, so we started, you know, suddenly so we found where, you know, in the Reading Evening Post, Reading have just found this guy, Robin Friday, and Robin Friday made his debut and, oh, he's just scored this goal and then there'd be a quote and then there was suddenly an interview with Robin and blah, blah, blah. So we just, um, and then we met his brother. We got put in touch with the brother, Lisa, his wife, blah, blah, blah. And it, the story just grew bigger and bigger. Yeah. And that's how it happened, you know. All because Gwigsy was pissed off he'd never heard of him. That's, that's, that's why I, I've met Gwigs twice. Um, yeah. And he's just, it's just the, the most calm, collected. I think, you know, if you could, if you could talk about, you know, smoking weed well the thing was the thing yeah. was i always thought he was so cool because there was all this madness going on but as he said he said i can go down the shop and buy a packet of fags yeah. yeah you know what i mean because he he kind of just kept it very low-key he lived out in mill hill which is sort of on the outskirts of london yeah um you know he had his he had a beautiful house got a beautiful house sky sports on all day long <laughs> little studio in the garden i mean he yeah. just had it sussed you know he, did, he wasn't interested in, you know, whereas Liam was, you know, five o'clock in the morning on Oxford Street doing coke, you know what I mean? You yeah, know, or getting yeah. in the fight or, or whatever. And Quixie just, he's a spliff-head Quixie, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, when I, mean, I, well, I said, I said, you miss Manchester. He says, well, I, says I, I like it here. He says, but I liked this. He said this in person to, to me and David last, last year. I like it down here, but I do miss being able to walk around the streets with a spliff. He says, you can do that in Manchester wherever you want. He says, down here, you got no chance. <laughs> he said, so that's mm. that's what he misses about Manchester. But he was uh, just an absolute gent, an absolute gent. And I think... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Himself. He's, he's, put, he's ducked out when he wanted to. He's done OK yeah. with his thing, isn't he? Fair, fair play, fair play. Yeah. Uh, the, the very last question you've got to know is, uh, were there any stories from your books that were edited out at the request of Oasis? No. No. Also, no. no. Yeah, everything's included, yeah. Yeah, everything that, yeah. Perfect. Everything that went in. I mean, the thing was, by the time I got to write Forever the People, uh, you know, everybody knew, you know, in terms of drug use, you know, everybody knew it, so there was no point kind of Oh, every night, you know, this night we did this or this. Do, do, do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was much more about just observing the band on tour, really. 
Um, what did you think of that, by the way? I love them both. I love them both. Uh, I think yeah. it's uh, the both. The both. Uh, I try. I like yourself. I've got a couple of young kids, so I used to read a lot more books a few years back, and I read them both many years back. And then I've tried my best to read them quickly before we spoke again. But with one kid being two, one kid being four, and we got a six-month-old girl. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's hard to keep reading. But the, both of the books, when I've read them the first and second and third times, they're just they're brilliant. And I think that's why right. that's why I think when people ask the questions on the groups, people always often join the group and then say, "What's the best book I can read first? And it's always getting high, always. Yeah, right, that's but, really good. Is it is it still um, able to be printed? Can you order copies of it? Or is it now? Yeah, just... you can. Yeah, you can get it on ebook. It's on a thing called Dean Street Press. Have got it. Yeah, what a physical copy. Well, you can get. You can actually. You can order a physical copy, and they'll they'll print it out for you. I was going to say to you is that we, we we did something similar to this with Jane Savage a while back, and she's done a, a great Britpop book, and she had a few copies reprinted for the group and signed them to people, and we chucked, she obviously paid for all the costs for it all. I'll have a chat with you about that and see if that's an option. I'll just drop you a message or something because it'd be good to get. Yeah, some... absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell the guy. They're down in um, Salisbury. They're down in Salisbury. Yeah. And basically, you can either get the book on, you can get it on ebook, or or they'll print up a they'll print up a they'll print out copies and send them to you. Well, what'll tend to happen is yeah, I'll put this on. I'll I'll, I'll put it on the group and um and I use this. If you set. want to do that, and I'll I'll sign them happily. It's not a problem. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. We'll we'll we'll, we'll cover the costs and you know get it all sorted. But that'll be it. Be there'll be a few people now that'll be sat there going on eBay and stuff. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking out loud that actually getting a signed copy, they'll jump all over that. They'll love a bit of that. Um, right. I'll, I'll 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 message you about that. But that's yeah. yeah. Okay. That's been absolutely brilliant. I mean, I knew as soon as I got the questions in, there's a few offshoot questions that will come from your answers, and it's gone down a treat. I think I do really appreciate your time with this because I know these things can be no worries, no worries. You know, I'm always always happy to um, always happy to help out. So, how does this work? Is this interview you're going to? It's so it tends to be that it's, I just record this, and it's just the Zoom, isn't it? So it's done and dusted. Now, if you're okay with it, I would just put it in the uh, the, the video up. And it's done then. Right, you, oh, so people will see the video. Of how yeah, you, uh, and then, okay. and then, rather, rather than sit and transcribe an hour's long, it's uh, it's uh, a bit easier. But we don't. We I was going really... to say because trans. I used to hate that man transcribing oh. tapes with. Oh. I did. Yeah. I did. I did one with Owen Morris, but Owen's Owen's a good friend of mine these days, and we just rabbited on for about an hour and a half. Yeah. I started trying to transcribe it, and I thought, good God, I mean, you don't realize how much Owen swears until you start writing down his uh, <laughs> his words. But is he still uh, producing? Yeah, yeah, he's over in Costa Rica now. Yeah, well, I actually wow. I met him. I said, you, you, it's funny you mentioned your plaque, the, the plaques behind you. You, you watch the story plaques. Because I work in finance, I went into a meeting randomly in Edinburgh, and it just happened to be in his gaff. And I walked into the meeting, I was like, oh, bloody hell, we're going to get on if you got all this on the walls. And yeah. just, it, was, it was Owen's missus that I was meeting for, for a wow. for yeah. meeting. And that's how we met. So he's, uh, it's just a small world. But um, yeah. now he's. Um, He's back over soon. He's back over in a couple of months. I'm meeting up for a pint after after COVID of sitting in the yeah. in my shop yeah. working away. Yeah. But listen, Paolo, that's uh bang on that. Really, really, really thank you. Really happy. All right, lovely. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. It was uh yeah. it was very enjoyable. And uh salutations to all your um to all to all the people in the group. Bang on, mate. I'll drop you a message anyway, but thanks again for that. Cheers, buddy. No worries. Take care. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Ciao, ciao, ciao.